I can't believe it's already been three years since my last YouTube video on face height and buccal fat pad removal. Buccal fat pad removal, also known as buccal fat pad removal, is a very popular procedure in my practice and it pairs very well with uh, face tight, which is a liposuction and skin tightening procedure. The last video is three years old, it's a little outdated, believe it or not. Um, and as I refine my technique over uh, 200 cases, I want to uh, update that video with some additional refinements. In this marking uh, scene, you can see that I'm identifying both the buccal fat pad region in that green square, as well as areas that I'd like to perform a little bit more aggressive liposuction, including that submental region and the fullness underneath the uh, jawline angle. Um, I also identify the midpoint so I can ensure symmetric heating and liposuction on each side. Um, prior to doing anything, I added a combination of uh, lidocaine, epinephrine, and bicarb to the areas where I plan on doing most of my work, and then I can slowly but surely uh, work my way up uh, to both the buccal fat pad marking as well as the, uh, as well as the soft tissues. Um, and I, I tend to uh, use betadine to prep the face, and I start with buccal fat pad removal prior to the face site. Uh, you can see here that the incision is no more than one centimeter in length, and I sort of meticulously uh, work my way down and, and cauterize any visible blood vessel as I identify that buccal fat pad. Buccal fat pad is pretty clear cut. You can see here that it sort of delivers itself, uh, and it's this brilliant yellow color that uh, a lot of other surrounding fat doesn't have. I've seen a lot of other plastic surgeons struggle with this operation because uh, they are kind of confusing this obvious and isolated fat pad with soft uh, tissue subcutaneous fat, uh, which is a little bit l duskier in color. It's not as richly yellow as this. Uh, the function of the buccal fat pad is, is questionable. Nobody really knows why it's there, but the thought is it's kind of a vestigial structure that helps with the suckling reflex uh, as a youth. Um, the most important part of this procedure, obviously, is, uh, is uh, hemostasis and ensuring that no uh, bleeding vessel is left behind. Uh, if you do have or encounter any bleeding during this procedure, it can lead to sort of a devastating outcome and certainly a take back to the operating room. But um, dissection should be relatively straightforward, and as you can see here, it's, it's most commonly done in my practice on awake patients. Um, it could be a, you can feel a little bit of pulling from time to time, maybe a little bit of singing here and there, but generally it's a it's a very well tolerated procedure um, that uh, that people uh, enjoy. Uh, the fat pads are usually the size of a very large grape or maybe even a kumquat. It's not something major, and I tend to take out as much of the fat pad, especially in men, as I as I possibly can. Um, I think uh, there's an artistry in buccal fat pad removal, uh, and in some cases you might want to take out a fraction of it, but people who are younger and they want to look more sculpted or they have a full face, I think it's a subtle procedure inherently, and taking out all of the fat pad is, uh, is warranted in most cases in my practice. You can see here it's a, it's a very large and sizable mass, um, and uh, it's certainly the size of the tip of your thumb. and. Um, and it's very satisfying. Patients always look at the fat pad afterwards. They always want to see it. Um, and um, they vary, you know, generally from, from patient to patient, but are roughly the same size, uh, regardless of the patient's ethnicity or, or, um, or fat content. Um, after this is done, we perform the face tight portion of the procedure. Uh, the patient tolerates this very well and, and will generally describe maybe some pressure and some and breaking through ligaments and things like that can can be a little bit uncomfortable patients usually don't complain about it i work my way um, up the lower face first and i generally start on the patient's right side as a creature of habit i'm constantly looking at the lower lip to make sure that there's no twitching uh, as this could indicate that there is a potential injury to one of the nerves that makes your lower lip straight um, and i'll go back and forth through this tissue a number of times until I reach my cutoff temperatures, which are generally in the um, 60, high 60 degrees centigrade internally and high 30s uh, externally. Of course, this can uh, vary based on the patient's need for tightening and ethnicity and, and whether or not the patient wears a beard, but um, as a rule of thumb, there's not too much variation. I work my way back and forth very patiently and slowly through this tissue, and I'm meticulous about record keeping because I don't want to overheat one side and underheat the other. 
Um, I don't have any any you know hard numbers uh, to say that I, I aim for this goal. Um, I'd like to use as much energy as, as, as sorry as little energy as possible uh, generally uh, to achieve my desired cutoff temperatures. Um, the more energy I need, the more likelihood of collateral injury in my opinion. So I like it when the final total ener energy is low-ish. I don't like when I see these huge numbers for the total amount of energy injected. I don't think that's going to lead to better outcomes. So I usually, you know, in the face, again, as a rule of thumb, it could be anywhere from uh, 8 to 15 kilojoules of energy in total, which is, is quite a bit. Um, I know without a frame of reference, that doesn't mean much to most people. Um, but that's it. And then uh, depending on the patient's goals, uh, liposuction is performed. And a lot of older individuals who have thin faces, I tend to do this manually. But people who are a little bit younger or full-faced, um, especially those who have diminution of the jawline because of subcutaneous fat, I don't, I don't feel uncomfortable performing liposuction in this area. Um, I don't uh, typically use power-assisted liposuction just because I think that I lose a little bit of control when I do that. Um, but I, I do like to sort of go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth with fine cannulas. And in this gentleman I used actually uh, as large as a three centimeter cannula in certain areas where I really wanted this to really sculpt out the jawline underneath his uh, mandible angle, which is sort of the corner of your jaw in the back by your ear. Um, and I kind of tapered down to 2.7 and 2.4 millimeter uh, single Mercedes tip cannulas as I continue to work my way uh, forward. Um, my decision to use uh, one versus the other is, uh, you know, power assisted versus uh, manual versus uh, suction assisted liposuction is, is certainly on a case by case basis. And this is the art of face type. When I'm done, I really massage the tissue, especially in a thicker skinned, younger individual like this, to make sure that I have a symmetric resection. I'm, and, and I, you know, I ask him to lift his jaw and lower it. <clears throat> and I'm constantly feeling for irregularities or, um, you know, basically asymmetries in the fat deposits. I have him extend and, and flex his neck, and, and generally, um, you know, my end point is when I don't feel any additional um, firmness or, or adiposity or, you know, collections of subcutaneous fat in any discrete regions. It's always a little bit unsatisfying as a lot of uh, the tumescent sort of hangs out by the, um, the preauricular region, so you always have a little bit of a bulge there. But, you know, uh, overall, once you, you sort of expect this to be the norm, it's not a big deal. Uh, the patient is treated with, uh, you know, copious amounts of bacitracin over the area after I cleanse it with uh, uh, saline. And they, they tolerate it. Well, this patient flew from out of town, and I'll see him in a few days.